welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us to the 36th Peer Mediation Conference. Uh, it is quite an honor to be here with you all today. Um, this peer mediation conference has been a collaborative of multiple organizations over the past few uh, decades. Um, definitely do want to give a uh, to Susan Chang, who has been spearheading it since the beginning, uh, and as well, although she would say it's been a collaborative effort, and uh, it's been truly wonderful to see how the community has come together, not only to educate uh, youth peer mediators everywhere from third grade all the way to 12th grade, uh, and then to be able to see some of those uh, peer mediators go on to um, be able to utilize those skill sets uh, in their lives, and then some of them even coming back to be trainers. And so you'll be able to meet some of them today, as well as learn a little bit about careers in the field and how you can, you know, these are not just skill sets that you utilize and are useful in the third grade to 12th grade range, but they are really truly lifelong skills that can truly help not only you professionally, but also on a personal level. But without further ado, I want this year's theme of the conference is uh, Together Through Mediation, and today's event is Peers and Practitioners in Having a Career in the Field with uh, Lisa Jacobs, Robert Lillis, and marie Spoke, and will be moderated by um, Katie Ranney, and a special guest of Fuetino or Tino Manu will be joining us as well. Um, I will introduce Katie and then turn it over to her. Katie is a peace builder facilitator, conflict resolver, who is currently working as a program development director at the Mediation Center of the Pacific. Uh, she's responsible for conducting outreach and training, as well as program creation and management. Um, independent facilitator, communication consultant for, uh, what's that, like the last 15 plus years now? So uh, wow. <laughs> at some point, we'll Crazy. stop adding the numbers so <laughs> you don't feel older. Um, <laughs> Katie has worked mostly with nonprofits and government agencies uh, to create substantial plans to strengthen and advance their endeavors. She's graduated uh, summa laude from Santa Clara University and earned her master's in communication from uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, as well as her grad certificate in conflict resolution from the, here, right here at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. Uh, she's interested in the development practice of empathy, as well as how digital communications helps groups connect and organize and hopes to apply it to her work at home in Hawaii. So thank you, Katie, for um, 30 year in a row uh, being our moderator. Much appreciate you. I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, take lead us along today's path. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, and thank you to everybody who is watching this um, live or in the recording that will come afterwards. Uh, before we introduce our panelists, I'd actually would like Tino to um, talk a little bit about and just give a little review of highlights of what happened at the 36th Annual Peer Mediation Conference that occurred just last week. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Latino Madu, uh, but I go by Tino. Um, like Jose mentioned, I am the social worker here at Farrington Teen Center. Uh, one of the services that I provide here is peer mediation um, training and, of course, conducting real-life peer mediation cases that we are referred to by really anyone on campus, whether it's staff or students, just really anyone. Uh, but yeah, so it was great this year. Uh, we were able to, um, Barrington High School and Kailua High School students, because it seems like they're one of the only two schools right now currently that we're aware of that are having... Um, a peer mediation program that is ongoing. Um, so yeah, our students, we got to head over to Kailua High School, um, spend the day there. Um, we got, we're able to just meet, of course, get to know each other. Um, I think what was very interesting and special about this one compared to last year was, like I said, they finally actually got to meet in person. And although last year's one was good, I know all of our students both at Kailua and Farrington mentioned that this would have felt a bit more impactful and, you know, just more engaging if it was in person. So worked hard to get that going. So I know that was a big thing and something that we're excited about. And just to just see them interacting. And I feel so for my students as well. In Kalihi, a lot of them were really leave the Kalihi area really in general. And a lot of them, actually all of them that I took, that was like the first time ever to Kailua High School. Some of them first time in Kailua in general. So just nice to like get them out of the environment and see, you know, a different perspective of how people with peers their age are living as well and whatnot. Um, so like I mentioned, that was a great thing, just having it in person. Um, so yeah, while we were there, Shelly and I, we both have our, our handouts from Barrington and Kailua, so we were able to kind of go through both, kind of compare and contrast the, um, the way that Shelly trains students there and the way I train students here. 
Um, and some of the things that we have a lot of things in common in terms of our material, but there were some things that were different. So it was just nice to kind of go in debt um, and kind of teach each other, their students and ours, different ways to go about it. So I think it was just nice for them to see that, you know, although there are different ways to learn about peer mediation, the main thing is that we all have the same goal in common, regardless of how we may approach it. Um, so yeah, while they, after we're able to look at both of our manuals and kind of compare and contrast, then we um, allowed our students to do run through a simulation. One group was able to do two, one was able to do one. Um, one of them was a student at UH Manoa. So she actually draft, drafted up a post simulation, which is a bit different format from how our students were trained. Usually they have like scripts kind of word for word. But this time, since we felt, you know, they had been trained, have a little bit more experience, we kind of wanted them off the fly to come up with their own narrative, their own dialogue, and really just kind of make it to, you know, their generation, how they're speaking, what they really see, how conflicts is acting out now. Um, so yeah, one simulation was about, um, geez, I just couldn't blank for a second. I'm so sorry. What was the simulation? I know one definitely was about a boyfriend and girlfriend and having someone else involved. Um, they were excited about that one. I think the other one I can't remember was like in class or something. So it was just good to interact. We mixed up the students, um, just seeing them engage. Um, and it was interesting because I know um, my understanding at Kylo High School, they do the training yearly, um, but it seems like they aren't able to really carry out and conduct actual peer mediation um, cases. We're here at Farrington um, and with the support of the staff and admin, especially that they do allow us to do that there. So it was great for Kailua to you know, hear from our students, like what they actually do, real life cases, get perspective, get advice, and just really seeing them interact and like socialize, especially after the past few years with a uh, pandemic where everything has been on online and virtual and where I see it has affected our students socially. So it's just good to see them get out there again and just, just be teenagers. And like I said, realize that regardless you're from Kailua, Farrington, you all really go through the same issues, you know, same similar issues. We may just handle it differently, but thankfully with having peer mediation, you know, it is just an opportunity to give to our students to be like, hey, there are other ways to go about solving conflicts rather than what may be the norm for you growing up which most of the time, especially here at Farrington that we see, it's not the best way. A lot of it is violence and all these other things. So yeah, and like I said, it was just great to see everyone, connect with Katie and Jose in person, because even with us for a while, it's just been all online. So just good to, yeah, see that. So that's just a quick recap of um, the mediation uh, session, our conference that day, last week. Thank you so much, Tino. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's really wonderful after having such a long hiatus um, because of uh, the pandemic and um, shutdowns and those sorts of things that the students were really able to connect across schools uh, and also to reestablish, reconnect, and reinvigorate their skills through the conference. So they were able to connect with each other, learn a little bit more. Um, and get a little bit more practice since they had been out of the out of it for so very long. So thank you so much. And we're gonna look forward to a wonderful conference next year as well. Uh, so from peer mediation, high school level, to uh, careers <laughs> and, and the use of mediation in adult professional and personal lives. I would like to introduce you all to our um, esteemed panel here. Uh, we have uh, Anne-Marie Smoke. Uh, Anne-Marie Smoke is an appellate mediation program administrator and trainer for the Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution at the Hawaii State Judiciary. She holds a graduate certificate in conflict resolution and a master's in travel industry management and sustainable tourism. Uh, she is a facilitator uh, for multiple policy development and strategic planning initiatives and has 17 years of training experience, including teaching conflict management practice. Thank you very much for being here, Anne. We also have Robert Lillis. Um, Robert Lillis built his portfolio as a parliamentarian through years of experience running deliberative forums. He is a former president of the Machinists Union LL1998 Honolulu and vice chair of the Labor Education Advisory Council at the University of Hawaii West Oahu. Robert is an active volunteer mediator with the Mediation Center of the Pacific and has unique experience with the EEOC LAMP, the LAMP program, and the Department of the Navy. He currently serves as a board member of the Conflict Resolution, Resolution Alliance Hawaii uh, and is a U.S. Navy veteran. Thank you, Robert, for being here. And finally, we have Lisa Jacobs. 
Lisa Jacobs heads her own mediation and collaborative law firm named Better Way Divorce, also known as Pono Divorce, where she devotes 100% of her practice to support families to resolve their disputes using non-adversarial processes. Lisa has been licensed to practice law in Hawaii since 1994. She has handled over 1,800 cases as a family law consulting attorney, 110 cases as a mediator, and 12 cases as a collaborative attorney with an agreement rate exceeding 90%. Lisa mediates divorce, paternity cases, and other family-related matters at the Mediation Center of Pacific. She also facilitates Kupunapono family conferences at MCP. Lisa has served as co-chair of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Section of the Hawaii State Bar Association since January 2015, and she's also secretary and past president of the Conflict Resolution Alliance, where she has served on the board of directors since January 2014. As you can see, we have, thank you, Lisa, as you can see, we have a wonderful and diverse um, panel here who can speak from uh, multiple different paths. Uh, and different perspectives of how mediation can incorporate within their lives. Uh, I'd first um, uh, like to ask you and to have you explain a little bit in about two, two to three minutes or so, just to how you got into conflict resolution or dispute resolution. And if we could have you first, we'll go down the line on how I introduced it, and Robert, and then Lisa, and we'll mix it up for other questions. Sure, sure. Um... It's an old joke I use, but there's so much truth to it. I'm going to start with the, the fact that I was always good at conflict and I just needed the, the resolution side and skills to make something of it. So um, I became interested in sustainable tourism management while I lived in Hawaii. And so I joined a master's program at the uh, School of Travel Industry Management, now part of Scheidler. And one of the electives included a course in community-based economic development, um, which um, has to do with facilitating community meetings. We did a lot of that throughout the class. And that course happens to be a, an elective in the, the graduate certificate program at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. So it, it just opened this door for me. I'd never heard of the Matsunaga Institute until that time. And of course, I immediately looked into it and, and signed up for the graduate certificate in conflict resolution. And I, I took every possible class I could in facilitation and mediation. Um, and gained a lot from it. So it was like the, the clouds parted and the rays of the heavens beamed down on me. And I said, this is it, I like this. Um, so I thought it tied well, certainly into um, community-based economic development regarding tourism and sustainable tourism. So I tried to make the most of it. Um, however, it um, actually took me more quickly to the university, to, <laughs> to the Matsunaga Institute at, to actually manage the certificate and undergraduate programs and do the outreach. So I was, I was the Jose before Jose. And um, so that, that's where the skills took me. They didn't get me into the tourism, but I have done a lot of work with tourism and I have done a lot of work in, in community facilitation because of um, the certificate program. So that's how I got there though. Wonderful, that's mm -hmm. a, great. Sometimes it just takes that little, that little spark and you're like, oh, a whole new path. This is it. Okay. <laughs> Robert, how did you get into into this? I sat on the other side of the table from the mediators. Um, as a union president and, and as a chief steward in my uh, shop, I, there was a lot of employee employ, uh, employee management conflicts, and I always encouraged the employees to try mediation first, and I would represent them, and I'd also train others to represent employees in mediation. And after a while, the mediators who I worked with um, started really um, – encouraging me to to uh, to become a mediator and after a couple of years i decided that the training was available and i decided to be trained as a uh, mediator for the department of navy and i got the training i got the certifications and then i started doing uh, mediations for the department of navy and i did that as a collateral uh, coll as a collateral duty um to to so when they had employee employer disputes mostly eocs and e um equal opportunity complaints employee employer 
disputes, I'd be call, called in to try to resolve the situation. But really, I saw it first from a representative's point of view and what was good, you know, which mediators were good emulating their style and 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 the ones that were not so good, I just learned from them too, because um, you know, what what doesn't seem to work well and 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 not do do that. So I came at, at it from, you know, from the other side of the table. And I've um I've enjoyed doing it. It's extremely challenging. I, I kind of like use the metaphor of the marathon, you know, you the Honolulu Marathon is very popular and people come from all over the world to run in that race. Now, running a marathon is not comfortable. It's 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 you know difficult. You have to train this and that. But those people who are running the marathon would rather be there than any other place on the planet at that time. And I I've trained for being a mediator. I, I want to do that. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's challenging and and all those things. So yeah. So that's it in a nutshell. So I. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah, seeing seeing it in action and then being able to learn the actual skills to do it and being able to apply it. That's really wonderful. Lisa, how'd you get into uh, conflict resolution mediation? Okay, well, um, I think as an ideal, kind of an idealistic um, younger person, I really wanted to use my skills to um, help help change the world, help help heal the world. Um, so the, the career path I, I took, think, thinking that it, it um, might make the most sense, is um, I went into the legal field. Uh, at first, I worked as a paralegal for several years to kind of get my feet wet and find out if law was something I really wanted to do. And then three, three years after receiving my undergraduate degree, I um, entered law school. Um, I kind of followed, though, a more traditional path um, through law school. And as a young lawyer, I had done some of the things that kind of people expect, quote unquote, the, you know, normal track to be a successful attorney. So I uh, wrote, I was an editor for the Law Review. I clerked for a federal judge, uh, just did all of the, you checked all the boxes to be kind of a conventional attorney. I worked at a large law firm in Honolulu uh, for a number of years. Then what I did was uh, had a young family and decided to pivot and work for um, as a civilian attorney for the Naval Legal Service Office at Pearl Harbor. That's where I got my feet wet in doing a lot of cases helping individuals, not corporations. So helping individuals solve their problems. There were a lot of family law um, type of matters. And so I brushed up on learned a lot about that and helping clients uh, through that process. I also specialized in helping uh, do adoptions, step parent adoptions and adoptions, grandparents um, adopt, adopting their, their grandkids and whatnot. So I got my feet really wet in the family law area. Uh, as my kids were growing, uh, found that I wanted to step back and take some time uh, raising them. So I did take some time off. And uh, while doing that, I got a bunch of facilitation skills, um, being a facilitator for my church and, you know, in small groups. So I found that that was something I really liked doing. I really liked um, facilitating meetings, also um, worked as a, as a lay, lay pastor, so really helping people through a lot of traumatic events, uh, so being a good listener, so honing my listening skills. Uh, when the time came that I was going to go back to working full time, I uh, decided I didn't want, I wasn't interested in practicing a more traditional type of law. It just didn't seem to really fit the type of person I am. Um, again, I, I wanted to heal and not, uh, you know, be a, a tool for making conflict, prolonging conflict. I really wanted to help build more peace. So I um, wanted to get more into mediation. And uh, th there's also a type of practice called collaborative law, which is similar to mediation because you're really focusing on problem solving. Uh, the main difference is, is that I can represent a party and be aligned with, with one party, but in working together with like a whole family, if it's a family uh, type of situation and really focus in on everybody's needs to try to come out with the best outcome that's gonna be sustainable and serve the family the best. 
So really caught on a lot with uh, with mediation. And, and so in 2012, that's when I decided to pivot my practice to mediation, problem solving and collaborative law and haven't stopped since then. Just took the leap and uh, decided I wanted to open up my own practice and really, really, really focus in on that. And it's just been really fulfilling. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really fantastic. Um, one of the, the things I, I noticed with all, all three of you is that the um, conflict resolution mediation section of it seems to go hand in hand with other interests and other specialties that you've really that you've pursued. Uh, and there is, I noticed a, a trend now for um, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, um, people studying actual classes of conflict resolution um, and, and mediation. And I was just wondering from your perspective of coming at it, you know, through a, an initial interest and, and blending it with conflict resolution, what are your kind of thoughts on um, these classes and, and studying just from this? And um, we'll mix up the, the order a little bit. We'll have Robert, if I can have your answer first, then we'll go Anne and then Lisa. Okay. Um, I like to study a couple, two sex, two really issues. One is negotiation skills, because I feel like as a mediator, what you are is a negotiator between both sides. You're trying to find a, a calm, a move forward uh, on the dispute. And, and and the other thing I like to study is uh, behavior economics because it explains a lot of what people are looking for in life and in and in resolving stuff. So those two areas I would encourage anybody who would want to become skilled in mediation is is take the time and study some good books on mediation. I could suggest uh, Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference and then uh, Jim Camp's uh, Start With No. Those, those are two basic books on negotiations. And then for uh, behavior economics, Daniel Kahneman's, um, you know, uh, a book, anything by him or Richard Thaler's um, uh, books on um economics and stuff like that those those two are Nobel prize winning economics in the behavior economics field uh, um daniel kahneman was a, a an actual psychologist who did work in behavior economics to try to figure out why do people make the decisions they they do and it helps a lot as a mediators to to have a a reasonable understanding and and just yourself so those are the areas i would um encourage anybody who would want to be good to to really look in, into those so thank you thanks thank you robert thank you for the recommendation and your thoughts you know, I'm glad you brought this up because it was actually in, in some of the notes that um, the talk points I wanted to bring up today, because uh, I think um, actually from my perspective, OK, managing the appellate mediation program for the judiciary and my experience in the field working with and for ADR practitioners for you know the last 20 years, um, I can tell you that mediation is no longer novel, right? It's not a new idea. You all know this, right? I'm not. I'm not uh, saying anything new. It's um, it's a practice and a field that's become as mainstream as law, although it doesn't have the roots and history aside from indigenous practices like Ho'oponopono or circle justice, which we should recognize have been around for centuries. Um, mediation and facilitation as we know it and practice it um, is, um, is it's really become mainstream and it runs side by side with law in a lot of cases or, or in the context of law. So uh, while ADR started as a variety of services and processes that were offered for free to members of the community because it was new and it needed to be put out there and promoted so it could take roots, today mediators can charge anywhere from $200 to $1,200 an hour um, for those services. So the field is far more competitive for practitioners. So uh, my belief is that credentials and experience really matter. And it can make or break who gets hired for a job. And it's not necessarily just a job in mediation or facilitation, but in the field of law or in a university or in a, a special education setting or social work or medicine. Um, Kaiser Permanente has a job opening right now for um, ombuds and for uh, 
for practitioners, uh, but it's within the context of medicine. So I think that the, the credential, whether it is a degree, it could be, you know, maybe a, a certificate or a degree in conflict resolution, like the Matsunaga Institute offers, or it can be a law degree with an emphasis in mediation or some sort of ADR or urban planning with an emphasis in facilitation. I think that the credentials um, actually do matter now and the experience and building on those, I think makes it a specialty that gives you the edge, but it makes it a specialty that, um, that kind of not just brings you to the table, but might just give you that extra leverage or, or step up on other people that you're competing with for jobs. I hope I'm answering the question that you're asking, Katie. Yeah, that... yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that the, um, that the study of it, it, either in conjunction with another thing, like you were saying, like urban planning and facilitation and, and, and that sort of conflict resolution, but ha actually having the credential for it because it is a little bit more well-known, a little bit more widespread. So getting a, a, a leg up on, um, you know, on, on other people who are pursuing it by having that actual class, those actual credential, credentials. That's, yeah. That's my feeling. Yeah. I, I don't know if my colleagues feel the same way. I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Lisa. Okay. Um, my thoughts about this is there are a number of ways um, you can kind of get your foot in the door um, and uh, get, get the credentials and the experience to be a good conflict resolver, an experienced conflict resolver. Um, I took probably a little more of a traditional path by becoming an attorney, um, just because with, in law, you, you already know that you're going to be dealing with problems every day. I mean, that is the core of what you're doing. Uh, you can either be working on the transactional side, trying to prevent uh, conflict or problems, or on the trying to resolve things. And unfortunately, so much of the way law is set up is it's adversarial. It's a zero sum game. And we know as mediators and facilitators and other kinds of conflict resolvers, we try to find solutions that are much more of a, either a win-win or, you know, people are getting uh, each, you know, each side is getting something of what they want. So, so although law is is probably still a very traditional way to go about it, um, uh, either coming through it as a transactional attorney or as a uh, more facing co conflict head on, pivoting as I did um, into mediation and um, other ways to resolve things. Uh, but there are also other ways because, of course, over at the uh, UH Manoa you can get a certificate in, in conflict resolution. Over at Pepperdine University, they have a, a master's program um, over at Strauss there. Uh, in, you can get a graduate degree in, in conflict resolution as well. So there are other ways to go about you know, getting the education and getting the experience. And just to share some of my direct experience, actually my mentors back in like 2011 and 2012, in, in helping me get the experience that I needed to be a good mediator, um, those mediators were not attorneys or you know recovering attorneys or <laughs> reformed attorneys. They were people uh, who were engineers, they were educators, they were financial planners. So they either had backgrounds in science and in business and education. So that's why. I, I'm not here to say that you have to get a law degree in order to be a, a conflict resolver or a mediator. There are other ways that you can um, get your feet wet and open the door. And there are plenty of people that you can seek a, a mentorship um, from. It's not gonna be lawyers. Sometimes lawyers are pretty jaded. You know, a lot of the retired <laughs> judges are pretty jaded. <laughs> and, and it's good to get um, experience and, and wisdom from a variety of sources. So I encourage everybody to find the people that you gravitate to, that you really like their style, their conflict style, and see if you can um, ask if, if, if you can, you know, get some coaching or some mentorship from them. Mm -hmm. Great. What I'm hearing from a lot of you is a lot about a lot about integration, right? You're looking at mm -hmm. um, it. There's not necessarily one path for this, um, and it is integrating different passions and different aspects of of um, study uh, or um, of you know different fields, and that having that 
come together with the skills that you learn um, as being a conflict resolver, as being a mediator or a facilitator, um, that it's really putting it together that can help make you, you know, make you either stand out in the direction that you're wanting to go in, but also just making things stronger um, for yourself. Kind of want to explore that also a little bit too, learning these techniques, learning about, you know, mediation skills and, and all of that. What effects have you seen within your life, not only professionally, but also personally, like how, how has that gone? Lisa, you know what, let's go, let's go back to you and then we'll have Robert and then Anne. Okay. I've found that my training in mediation and in facilitation, and also I've uh, received training in nonviolent compassionate communication um, from D D D Dr. Marshall Rosenberg's work. All of those training and learning and learning from uh, cohorts and other people who are interested in wanting to learn and train and learn more in those er in those areas have really enhanced uh, not only my professional life and my professional skills, but also personally. Um, you know, just practicing the active listening, uh, nurturing, empathetic uh, listening also, and, and uh, trying to see the other person's point of view um, when you're in conflict. It's just, it really, really helps. <laughs> and uh, I've got three, three grown kids, a, a spouse, um, you know, friends, uh, find that, uh, you know, uh, conflict is going to inevitably occur. Uh, to some degree or another, uh, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, what we can do in learning these skills is prevent it to the extent we can. And um, when there are conflicts, um, just knowing good ways, but good practices on how to manage it and uh, resolve it. And uh, it really, and then I find a ripple effect is that, you know, if, if, You've got people who are positive and focused in on constructive uh, communication and problem solving. You know, you, you spread that those good vibes out, and it just keeps on going. <laughs> so um, that's what I, I feel really strongly that it, those are really important skills to. I, I would highly encourage everyone to um, obtain the, the training and uh, learn those skills because it's just it, it really <laughs> helps reduce the stress level. I I can tell you uh, quite on a personal level, it really, it really, really helps a lot. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I love, I love the, the ripple effect of good vibes <laughs> through mediation skills as well. So, um, Robert, how about you? I, how do you um, I would just reiterate what Lisa said, listen, 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 active listening, pra practice listening. You'd be surprised how much people appreciate when you really when you really listen to them i mean <laughs> it's just an amazing um gift you can give to other people and i do mean a gift you, you know when you listen to their stories listen to what they have to say and, and many times that's all it's surprisingly that's all that's needed to resolve a conflict is people need to be heard they may not get what they want but at least they got heard and, and and they got acknowledged that they that and so it's so important important the other the other thing is i would say is be ready to accept criticism you know it, it, um as a mediator as a human being and help and ask people to help you know say you're a mediator and somebody says you're treating me unfair well explore that how am i treating you unfair you know, I want to know if if you're accusing me of being, are you know, let me hear it, hear that. I want to know so I can correct it or I, I we can explore this. Mm -hmm. So I think those things are. I mean, you can learn a lot. The skills you learn as a mediator, as a negotiator, because I, I see those as very very similar, is to negotiate between folks is is just a remarkable skill and. You, you, it, it's empowering because you don't feel like you take can be taken advantage of is or you know when you can be taken advantage of and you avoid those situations so learning on uh, negotiation mediation skills um is as i taught people these schemes are said they really say man these are life skills they say th these are life skills that you can use for family friends you know your spouse your your significant others and everything and and it, it 
it we're not always nice but we we were kind and 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 use this ki very kindly and it's not always nice because mediation is not always nice resolving conflict is not always you know touchy it can be very rough and tumble but you can do this with a lot of kindness and there's a huge difference between being nice and being ki kind and um i try to error on kindness oh. So, so being learning these skills and 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 practicing them, you can oh, and, practice any, negotiation, yeah. right? Any opportunity. I do a lot of mediations, as you know, from for the center, and I do some for the EEOC. And the opportunities. I mean, practice your skills. If you want to be a good golfer or good anything, you have to practice. It just doesn't happen. You don't wake up one night and be, you know, be able to, you know, putt or anything else, you know, you have to work at it, at it. And, and the only way you can do this is practice and get a good mediator. Like Lisa said, you know, find people who you can bounce ideas and, and get the feedback you need. If you, you messed up in a mediation, you messed up. Okay. You can, you can recover, you can learn uh, from, from, you know, mistakes that you make and, and you missed a shot, you missed a putt, we'll learn from those things, you know, and in mediation, there's learning, but it's it's harder because it's hard to judge if you did a good job. And that's just one of those things, you know, did I do a good job of the mediation? Did I really serve the, these folks and try to resolve this? You're not going to resolve all conflicts. And many times the conflicts need to be handled with the judge or some other the, the conflicts are going to get resolved how they're going to get resolved in a peaceful calm setting like a mediation where there might be some heated dialogue but but you're in control or you may have a third party come in there and just dictate to you what the solution is going to be and you lose control with that so in mediation at least you have control over the outcome so i've always you know, encourage people to try to work, work things out in mediation rather than having a judge or a jury or anybody else impose a settlement on them. Okay. And, and so, as you say, these skills, these mediation skills are life skills, accepting, uh, being able to accept and work on criticism, being able um, to negotiate well, to see different sides, um, uh, being able to maintain kindness, uh, even in faces of adversity, and being able to identify conflict, to prevent either preventative in your own life um, or to resolve it. These skills are all just integrated into life. Yeah, that. Thank you, Katie. You're doing a wonderful job in showing <laughs> people your listening skills and your active <laughs> things. So, uh, if you're paying attention, Katie's doing a wonderful job of me of showing the skills that is needed in a good mediator so thank you for that oh, thanks robert thank you <laughs> and how about you how have you seen the effects of, of these skills well first i agree with robert you're demonstrating them right now um and and bravo because it does i mean for for things like this it it applies and it matters and i i think that that has been developed and you're good at it because of the practice and because of what you've learned through your conflict resolution training um but i think over time and um having taken every workshop and training and professional development i could and still do when i can um I know that you develop a toolbox. I think we all develop these toolboxes with practice and time. And it, they're toolboxes that you can hopefully draw from to say the right thing, right? Or to ask the right question in a way that is going to either diffuse or mitigate a contentious situation or, you know, hopefully generate maybe productive conversations. So I don't always get it right, but I know that there is a right way. And there's a better way than the quick emotional response that um, I've practiced most of my life. And that, that's what I'm always working to, to get over. And I think we, a lot of us might have that tendency to react emotionally. And it's, um, we're hard, hardwired actually to do so. If you're familiar with the amygdala hijack, right? It's part of the brain that regulates emotional and behavioral responses. And um, it's basically the fight or flight response to stress which we face all the time. And we're hard, hardwired for survival. Um, and it goes back to our ancient Neanderthal ancestors who needed to react instantly to saber-toothed tigers. And um, even though 
uh, we've evolved physically and and in so many other ways are that uh, that limbic system is still intact. And so even though the stressors are different, we don't have to worry about saber toothed tigers creeping up behind us. Um, we do have to face a lot of other things, maybe a classmate who has humiliated us or um, we feel threatened by someone who doesn't understand or value um, our beliefs. Uh, we disagree because we believe um, very differently in something. Um, so many things, so many stressors, and we react the same way. Um, to, it's that same fight or flight response. So we're constantly trying to overcome that. And I think that the conflict resolution skills that we learn come with um, a lot of important things like self-reflection and being able to make sure that you are not um, being um, judgmental or, or opinionated. You're, you try to remain neutral or you try to keep an open mind to hear uh, the other side of the story. And, and that self-awareness is so critical in life. And so are all of these values um, that you learn as you're learning conflict resolution skills. They, they apply in so many situations. Um, and it, it's, you know, good communication skills and practicing thoughtful responses. Um, all of those things can be valuable day to day. In, in your work at home and your, you know, in your paddling team, whatever you do outside. So, um, yeah, so I think that both communications and the self-reflection can help us manage our amygdala's impulses or help us be aware that somebody else has them so we can help them through it, um, it just uh, to make us more effective in life. Just the, the everyday interactions, being able to keep, keep yourself managed, um, being able to understand others, um, taking it really from that, you know, you use it, you've used it in a professional way, you're having official mediations and, and having people come to you with your problems, but then even just in the everyday life, um, being able to say what you mean to say and have it be received well, um, being able right. to understand when other people don't have the same training as you. So that's you that bettering bettering yourself through that mm -hmm. it actually kind of dovetails quite well um i want to ask a, a another one that's a more of a, a personal question because professionally when you as you mediate as you facilitate you're in these environments where there are people there who ha have been amygdala hijacked they have high emotions <laughs> and they're and they're coming and they're coming at you of like I want my way. I want this thing resolved. This is their wrong. Kind of that feeling is all there. And you're able to hold space for them. You're able to hold space for their um, emotions. But one of the things that, that has come up in previous peer mediation conferences, we asked them about topics that they were interested in. And a lot of, it, um, a, a good portion of it was about their own self-regulation um, about, you know, caring for their own mental health and 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 for their own, um, uh, you know, their own anger management kind of a feeling. Like those those sorts of things were very important to to the high schoolers who um, either participated in the program or are mediators themselves. And I was wondering what you all do to take care of yourself to make sure that your mental health is 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 taken care of well um, when you're in the face of conflict on the daily um, and even more so than just the normal everyday kind of thing. So what is it that you do to um, really take care of yourself? Um, we'll go and if we can hear from you, then we'll do Robert and Lisa. Well, yeah, you know, I don't practice like my colleagues do. I administer a program, although um, uh, I'll get into a little more of, of some of the ex um, exposure that I do get to the practice of it. But um, so I'd like to hear what they have to say about this. But I can say that after a day of reading and evaluating appeals where people are super entrenched in their positions and they want to win or they want vindication or they even want to do as much damage to the other party as they possibly can uh, to you know somehow balance their suffering um, it makes me lose faith in humanity <laughs> also i sit in many mediations uh, to either host uh, the zoom platform for the appellate mediators or sometimes they'll ask me to participate as a co-mediator and i see firsthand what what hate looks like and it can be emotionally fatiguing so um 
for me, I engage in things where people are doing good work, um, like volunteering um, with beach cleanups or with uh, the NOAA whale count um, or with a group who puts gifts baskets together for um, the Institute for Human Services at Christmas time um, because it it renews my faith in humanity and it lifts my spirits. I, I just I realize that it's not all about not liking each other or doing damage to each other, but there's a lot of good out there. So you really need to just keep involved with stuff like that that gives you uh, that lifts your spirits, you know, and, and and it makes you feel like you're you're part of a, a group, a community of people that want to do good, that want to help. Um, I also do breathing meditation with a group called The Art of Living, and they're nice people and they're very supportive. And um, so that is really helpful, finding some sort of outlet, uh, whether it's meditation, whether you jog, um, just give time, you know, just silent time, peaceful time with yourself to just decompress um, or do it with a group um, and decompress out loud. Debriefing is one of my very favorite things to do. And um, some of my mentors, David Chandler and Karen Cross and uh, Kem Lowry uh, were huge on debriefing. That's the first thing you did when you finished a tough mediation was to sit together and talk about what went right, what went wrong, what you can laugh about, uh, what you want to cry about, and just work it out together as a group. And it was that, that group, almost like group therapy, that was really, really helpful. Um, so yeah. Um, and then finally, I, I take a lot of walks and listen to music with my husband, and we laugh a lot. And laughter is always good medicine. Laughter is the best medicine. Yes. <laughs> um, and having a group connecting with others who can understand um, what uh, what it's like uh, and being able to, yeah, do that debrief, have that have that support for you. That's awesome. It's great. Robert, how do you care for yourself in the face of all of this? <laughs> well, I was going to say, start with what you ended with was go for a walk. You know, in the book, uh, getting to yes was kind of like uh, the beginning book for any mediator. They'll always tell you, read the book, getting to yes. And they talk about in negotiations, going to the balcony. And to me, I look at going to the balcony as going for a walk. Just go for a walk, you know, think about what you're thinking about and go for a walk. And um, I mean, this place, Hawaii is such a beautiful place to walk. There's so many good places to walk and there's so many safe places to walk. Go for a walk. And get, you know, get, and if you're having a conflict with somebody, go for a walk with them. I think that's bravo, and for you and your husband going for a walk. <laughs> I think that, you know, um, that's a, that's a brilliant, brilliant idea because there's something, you know, the, um, you can talk while you're walking, you can resolve things. It's a calming effect. You know, you talk about your brain functioning when you're walking. I mean, we're meant to walk. I mean, we have two legs. We're not meant to sit. We're 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 designed to walk and 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 exercise, a light exercise and a walk. That's that's what I do, and I would recommend that to any anybody at any age to to walk. And you know, we have a lot of hills here, so walking isn't always a the easiest thing, you know. But it, there's a lot of good, nice walks you can take. Take and. That's what I do is I go for a walk. That's my going to the balcony is going for to a walk. Getting getting out there, getting out there, getting out into um, sun and wind and uh, getting your body moving. That works too. Lisa, how do you take okay. care of yourself? So yes, I uh, the way I look at self-care is I do it on a couple of levels, uh, kind of my own personal, not related to con conflict, resolution uh, type of self-care. So um, like Robert and like Anne, I enjoy walking. I also enjoy cycling with friends. I especially did a lot of that during COVID because there was hardly anything else you could do <laughs> other than stay home. So I had a couple of friends and we we biked all over Kailua <laughs> and the Woodward side you know, and step, you know, kept our six feet apart and whatnot. Um, <laughs> some other additional things I like to do, um, hobbies and things that provide a lot of uh, stress relief is music. I like to um, play piano, play guitar, ukulele, sing. Uh, so that helps, you know, um, helps keep me sane. <laughs> so those are a couple of things that aren't really directly related to uh, conflict resolution that I like to do with, uh, for self-care. Uh, the more sort of, um, other type of self-care that's a little more related to 
mediation conflict resolution is I like to band together with uh, with groups who do similar work that I do because I know that we have kindred spirits are uh, you know we, we we think a lot alike on the same levels and and oftentimes we do work that's very very similar so I'm um, as you heard in my bio I'm a volunteer mediator and trainer for the Mediation Center of the Pacific so I like to attend zoom monthly um, brown bag meetings where we will share our frustrations and it's very common uh, the type of problems we we run into um, being volunteer mediators and bouncing ideas um, getting that support from other mediators is really important and really i think help, helps keep us uh, reinvigorates us and then in addition to that um, a bunch of us are on the call. We are all board members for the nonprofit, the Conflict Resolution Alliance. So coming together and we're all, you know, we have our values are similar in that we really, really, um, that's an important element of our being is to be, uh, you know, really get our feet wet and dig deep into how we can help uh, within our group and within the community at large uh, encourage each other and the community to resolve conflict in a, in much in a much more peaceful manner. So you know, on that organizational level, aligning um, myself with other like-minded um, um, people is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Physical it seems physical care um, and and social right, being able to get together with people who with, with like values, people who can understand, people who you can talk with. Uh, I'm going to go slightly off piece of the prep for a little bit because this got me a little interesting, uh, got me a little interested in this is after the work has been done and you're caring for yourself and it's in integrated in your everyday life. When you're in the midst of a mediation or a, or, or a situation wherein, you know, you're trying to help resolve the conflict um, and you find that your own emotions are getting kind of riled up and you're getting in there in that moment is there something that you do that can help calm yourself down that can help to center you and focus yourself I'm going to kind of leave this open since um, I think you might need a little bit of time to think about it um, I, I I allowed them I'll, to I'll prep for some stuff but this one wasn't part of it I'll jump in on that because this is something that I've actually tested recently. Um, the meditation I do is breathing. It's a breathing yoga and it has to do with, um, you know, real uh, concentrated breathing and, and different types of breathing and breath. And there is a large body of research now on how breathing techniques um, even the Navy SEALs do it now, and they've studied it. Um, but breathing techniques actually lower blood pressure. They um, they allow you to to make better decisions. They show that your judgment is better. And my mom uh, was recently um, in the hospital, and she ended up having to be on oxygen when she left the hospital. And so we had to do the pulse ox tests. You know, the little clip you put on the finger, and you can actually see uh, the the oxygen levels. And um, and it was interesting because she is um, she's a mouth breather and breathes very fast. And so I taught her, I just said, just, you know, I, I, your oxygen is low and I really want to try something. Just try this breathing technique. And um, I want to measure it to see if this actually works. And sure enough, I mean, I just had her breathe through her nose and do the five, two, seven, which is the, the basic Navy SEAL one that you see, you know, breathe in slowly for five seconds, hold your breath for two, and then let it out slowly for seven. And she did it and her pulse ox just instantly went up. So it, physically, you actually change when you breathe slowly. So that's something that you can do without people even knowing. You can just teach yourself or learn breathing techniques that when you're starting to feel uh, in, you know, overwhelmed or the emotions are getting high and it's affecting you or your own amygdala is getting hijacked for whatever reason, you can kick that in and it, it really can slow you down. It's kind of amazing. And also having, giving yourself, allowing yourself uh, to just say time out. I, I, let's take a break and just knowing, recognizing that this is the time that you are going to only be effective if you can step outside for a second and just give everybody that chance to say, let's just take a break now. I think we can all just take a walk or stretch, come up with whatever excuse you want and just make it feel natural and, and actually do that and do some of the centering techniques that we've all learned, either it's breathing or putting your feet on the floor and identifying five things around you. There's just so many different, really cool techniques to do that. 
that's awesome. That's a, so wonderful. To, to that's really cool to hear. <laughs> Sorry, that just you, you're like I. We actually had a monitor. I and, checked it out myself. <laughs> Oxygenated, get your brain working, and get yourself calm. Love that. So five in, count of five in, hold for two. It's five two seven, seven is out. is one of many, but that one is of one of many. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. Okay. yeah. Great breathing. Yeah, and a very um in obtrusive way of just regulating yourself. Lovely. Robert or uh, Lisa. Have any... Okay. I'm going to go in there with is sometimes it's, you know what your buttons are. Like, are you going to get accused of something and this and that? And, and we do a lot of role-playing in the mediation field where we pretend or I shouldn't say pretend we assume a role as, as one of, and we work on it so that, when things happen, you're you're more prepared because if if you know you're gonna maybe be accused of being biased, if you're gonna be accused, you'll have something that you can rely on quickly because you you've practiced it. Like my for myself, it's you know if I get an accusation, it's helped me understand how I was unfair to you. Help me understand how how I lied to you. If that mm -hmm. that is help me, I, I want to know and. It, when you're prepared for something, you don't get thrown off. Now, you, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get thrown off. And and if you do get thrown off, those techniques are are excellent. Call a call a meeting, a break, you know, walk, go for a walk, but also prepare for what you think, you know, because you can sometimes know a lot of the typical response when people are upset. Um, people get very embarrassed in, in mediation because stuff gets revealed about them that they really are embarrassed of. They they haven't done, you know, they agreed to do X, Y, and Z, and they were ordered by the court to do X, Y, and Z, and they, they failed to do that. And, and they want to, but at the same time, they don't want to because it might cost them a lot of money or this and that. So they're trying to avoid it. And when you see these conflicts, you can be prepared to help. You know, there's typical behaviors. Now, there's freeze, um, flight, freeze, and freeze. Or, um, you know, you either want to fight, you want to run away, or you freeze. And the typical behavior of most people is to freeze. And as a mediator, it's not good to freeze. If you notice you're going to freeze up because of a conflict, then and, and, you know, like Ann says, prepare yourself to be able to say, hey, you know, I need a break here. So let's call this a break. So you'd even practice that when you find yourself tensing up when something is very awkward to you. You might just like, you know, practice that before it happens so that you're ready when, when you do get thrown, not to freeze, that you know what to do. It's let's take a break here and uh We'll reconvene in about 20 minutes. So having that self-reflection and pre preparation beforehand of being like, where might I get a little uncomfortable? Where might I start to to um, feel my, my emotions start to rise? And then being prepared for that when you're going in, maybe having a plan of like, okay, I'm, when, when I feel this way, I'm going to, I'm saying, going to take a break or, um, going to utilize a breathing technique so that you don't have to think about it in the moment you're already kind of prepared for it uh, uh, yeah yeah getting prepped ahead of time lisa anything to add you have your own um technique oh but both ann and robert gave really great tips and you know i <laughs> you know i mirror what, what their comments say you know the breathing taking a deep breath um and also just being self-aware of knowing where your trigger points are and that I, I, another thing I really try to also um, keep in mind, in mind at all times is uh, try not to take things personally when you've got people in mediation and they're frustrated and they could it maybe their way of uh, coping is, that, you know, they might try to turn the attention on the mediator and criticizing the mediator and saying the mediator is impartial or judgmental or this or that, you know, saying something that something that's bad about um, about my behavior. So, so having that self-awareness beforehand and knowing that um, these things might come up, these criticisms, these judgments might come up and really trying to not take things personally, realizing that uh, I was not the, I'm trying to help them resolve their problem. I, um, I, by no means am I trying to, you know, make this problem worse. Um, you know, that these 
people came in and they came in with their problems. And um, I can't see any realistic way how a mediator or a conflict resolute resolver of a facilitator is making the problem worse. That's just, um, <laughs> I, I, I just can't, uh, will not believe that that's the case. So with all of those things in the back of my mind, um, try, trying to you know keep my cool, if, if it's possible to take a break, uh, I will, or if it's that um, we're in a joint session and the arguing is going on and it's, uh, we're having, uh, I'm having uh, challenges managing it, then, uh, you know, the breakout, if we're doing a Zoom mediation, the breakout rooms will start <laughs> opening and we'll start putting people into their rooms and that, that could um, significantly reduce the conflict right away. If I happen to be um, volunteering um, as a co-mediator, um, taking a break and perhaps meeting with my co-mediator and just letting him or her know that I'm being triggered and uh, just taking those few minutes to breathe and realizing it's not it's not about me. Um, it's about them trying to resolve things and I'm trying my best and so is the other mediator. And, and also hoping that if it's a voluntary process that the court, court has not kind of forced them into mediation, that they are trying, but just that they, you know, they, they need guidance, they need support. And so it might not be the exact time, <laughs> you know, uh, for, the, for the conflict to resolve itself and they need time to vent, they might need uh, some fingers to point, you know, point to because they're frustrated and uh, just try to be as positive um, and, and constructive as possible. Yeah, I, I, I think that that is a lifelong skill that many may <laughs> that, that, to, to, to really develop the not taking things personally, being able to separate yourself from from that and recognizing some people may come at you if you're in that situation, um, because they are just upset in general, and you're um, in your uh, an outlet for it. Um, and, and being able to to have that, that yeah, that bit of separation. Um, I think that's a that's a yeah a lifelong skill to develop, um, one that that um, kind of go over and over again. But thankfully, with like mediation and that sort of thing, you can practice it um, and have that in other areas. So if you are creating something, no matter what field you're in, um, and there's a critique on the thing that you've created, you can have that skill of already learning how to um, not take things personally. That's another life skill through through um, through mediation and conflict r resolution. That cr critique of a process or critique of a creation is not critique of you as a person yourself. Um, and so that's elk. That's fantastic. That's a great way of reminding yourself of of the purpose of this and the intention behind it, and and mm -hmm. to, that it's not about you as a person. So that can be very helpful. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to kind of bring it a little bit in and with your professional and bring it kind of back into the schools as well. Um, you've talked about the skills, uh, you know, in your life and, and how it is moving forward and a little bit in, in your careers. But with the, um, for our uh, current peer mediators, the ones who are part of this conference and hopefully um, some ones that are uh, coming up um, soon, uh, what would you say to them? What do you have something that you would want to either encourage them or, or let them know or, or, or have them to think about these peer mediators who are learning how to mediate who maybe for the first time, um, probably for the first time and helping their classmates resolve disputes. Is there something that you'd like to say? Um, let's have uh, Robert um, and then Lisa and then Anne. Well, okay. I started out as a person who is using a mediator to resolve conflict. So I was on the one side of the table and there, there was, um, you know, I was advocating for an employer, employee against an employer. And what was the most important lesson I learned, I got really got this from the book Chris Voss wrote on uh, Never Split the Difference, is the importance of respecting the person on the other side of the table from you in a dispute. It is so important to respect that, them and show them respect and do everything you can. So as a mediator, I want to respect both sides. No matter how much I think one side is right or the other side is wrong, I have to, I mean, I feel that I owe them as a mediator to show them uh, an inordinate amount of respect 
and 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 really respectful listening, respectful behavior. You know, it, that doesn't mean I agree. Respecting people's does not mean that you agree with them or even see their point of view, but you can be respectful to their opinion, to their point of view and every everything else. And if there's anything that was very difficult is respecting somebody on the other side of the table who I thought was outrageous, their behavior I thought was terrible. I thought they were just a scum, but okay. And I still have, I have an obligation to show them respect. If I'm going to negotiate a, an agreement with somebody, if I don't show them respect, the chances of getting an agreement that is workable is almost nil. However, when, as a mediator, I can I can show both sides respect and mirror that, and maybe they, they can get a little bit of that to help each other show a little respect and, and find a resolution to the conflict. And the other thing is don't run away from conflict isn't something we should avoid. I mean, it should be something embraced, but there's a way to handle that peacefully and, and, and productively. You know, it may not look peaceful when people are you know, yelling at the table or this and that, you can slow it down. But, you know, conflict can be so good to find a good solution because many times that's all you need, need is to find a good solution to these uh, these things. And sometimes sometimes it's just a matter of somebody apologizing or acknowledging, you know, a mistake that was made, not, you know, and and trying to resolve it. So it's it's very positive uh stuff we're dealing with here. Okay. Did I say Lisa next? <laughs> Sorry, I said Lisa next. <laughs> Okay, so so the question is, what would I say to uh, current uh, peer mediators who are learning how to mediate? Yeah, I, I would say they are. You're uh, bravo, <laughs> bravo. I mean, they are doing something that is so useful. I mean, it's a life skill that they are learning. I I, I really wish that all schools, like it, would be part of every student's curriculum to to be trained in mediation. Uh, conflict management, um, get, getting nonviolent communication. These skills are so important, you know, for 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 people to live much more healthy, productive lives. So, so those people who are doing it on their own time, it's not part of the school curriculum. So they're, I guess, they're getting the training after school. They're volunteering, doing their mediations after school. That you, you know, the, you are the angels on campus that are really helping um, to create more peace um, in your community. So, um, and I know with that, it's fulfilling when you help resolve um, conflicts, but it also is uh, trying on your time, on your energy. So going back to the self care that. Um, you know, they need to look out and just make sure that they're getting the self, the kind of self care and support that they need to keep going. Because I know that if you're devoting so much of your time in your studies and then your free time, you're, you're volunteering to do this, um, it, it could be, I, I could imagine it could be really, um, uh, really trying on your, on your body. And if, if there's any way that they can get uh, some kind of cr uh, credit, uh, I mean, thankfully, you can go on your your college application. I I would imagine on, in your essay. But if there is ways that um, peer mediators' uh, efforts can be recognized, or that they are given uh, some form of credit to uh, keep them going and keep them encouraged, and encourage other people um, who may have the skill set and the empathy and the listening skills um, to get involved in it, I'm all for that. So yes, I just whatever we can do to help. Um, encourage the schools to uh, embrace it to a greater extent and for more students to get involved. And I'm sure that everybody on this call would 100% support um, us, uh, you know, given the thumbs up on that. Absolutely, and Anne. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna sound like I'm doing a training because I'm just gonna regurgitate some of the things that have really helped me. Um, one is practice as much as you can. If you can, you have the opportunity to mediate, do practice as much as you can or co-mediate as much as you can. Practice the communication skills that you learn, like being able to summarize, paraphrasing or reframing to take the baggage and judgment out of things that you say. Practice that daily, not in any conversation, not just when you're mediating. Um, practice self-reflection. However, 
however you do that, whether it's meditation, thoughtful time alone, processing things that have impacted you, um, and then uh, b being able to open up to a trusted friend or family member. Make sure that your intentions are neutral and that you don't have any skin in the game or any um, you, that you're not bringing your own, own agenda and opinions into the problem solving that you're trying to, to um, help with. Um, don't don't take things personally. Um, like I've heard Lisa and Robert say, don't take it personally. Practice self-care. Step away if you start feeling overwhelmed or consumed by problems that you're trying to help solve. Um, and I don't mean walk away. I mean being able to call time out, like I said before, or let's convene another day when our emotions have settled, or I just need time to process stuff. So let me let me try this again, you know, in another time. Um, this is one that we've all learned in mediation: separate the people from the problem. Right? Um, you can't change the people, so you need to home in on the problem or the behavior that needs to be fixing. So make sure that you're doing that, and you're not trying to um, convince people that that somebody can be changed or that they can get them to see it their way, because that that's not the end game. That's not what's going to be sustainable anyway. And then finally, um, just like Robert said, know that everybody has their truth. Um, they have their side of the story and it's real and it's just as valid as anybody else's in the room. And that's super important. Oh, I just feel like I've been um, <laughs> just so much truth and so much knowledge all at once. It all seems so wonderful um, and, and, and great. Um, I kind of want, uh, so we we're, we're running a little bit up against, uh, a, a little bit up against time. Um, so I would, I, I'd really actually like for this last um, question to just be, is there anything that you wanted, um, any of the three of you wanted to say or or want a, a point that you'd want to, that maybe didn't get covered in the questions that you would like um, to talk about, either about schools and peer mediation programs or to peer mediators themselves um, or how it is part of you know part of your your professional life and how this and and how this has gone forward i just kind of want to give people a, a one last um little a, a little bit of time to to say something if maybe we, it didn't get covered yet um i'll i'll kind of leave it open i'll, I'll look for nonverbals if somebody wants if somebody wants to say something okay. I'll, I'll just okay go ahead robert I would say learn how to slow it down and prepare. You know, if you're going to do um, cook a meal, fix a tire in a car, almost anything you're going to do, slow it down, make sure you know what you're do doing, and, and, and just that calming stuff. Give yourself, before you go into mediation, don't be harried. You know, give yourself a chance to have your papers all in order, your opening statement, you've practiced that, you understand this and that, you have the paperwork, you have the names of the people, you know what, you, you know what information is available to you, and just keep it calm, keep it slow, and slow is fast. I mean, really, when you think of, about it, because you're, you're just doing it at a calm and gentle way with so, so yeah thanks thank you robert and uh, you know what robert said it be be prepared be prepared physically be prepared mentally be prepared emotionally write down talk points write down if you hear somebody say something you think that's exactly what i need to say next time that happens write it down you know have a whole list i have a whole list of soft starts to difficult conversations, things that I hear people say that I write down or things that I hear in a training or things that I read in an article. Um, practice them and have them ready, but be prepared. Be prepared for um, just be prepared for the absolute worst, which is that, you know, you become overwhelmed and, and you know, feel like the deer in the headlights and you don't know where to go next. Be prepared for that. And anything else is gonna be a lot easier, um, but yeah. Robert's right. Just be prepared for it in, in every way you can and be prepared to um, to just kind of step outside and, and take a break and recheck and reset. And it's okay. That's all okay. Lisa, and you asked. Yeah, being prepared is really, really important. And at the same time, also remaining flexible. Because I could have 
an idea of how the process I would like it to go, but oftentimes it, it will end up going veering off into a different direction. And so just um, having that, uh, keeping that space open for uh, the flexibility to realize that this could change direction. And that is the way it probably should have, should be going, you know? And so just being, um, just being open to the idea that things will likely <laughs> take a turn. I, I've, I've had cases where, heck, I didn't think that we were gonna get to an agreement, but half hour before we finished, boom, we've reached an agreement. And I think part of that was just keeping that flexibility and still that kind of that cheerleading type of um, support and spirit there. And uh, so, yes, it's, it's this interesting balance about having structure, but then on the other hand, and on the other hand, being open to almost anything happening <laughs> and feeling comfortable uh, realizing that chaos <laughs> could, can, can ensue and what can we do and, and being and at the same time also being mindful of time <laughs> because of course you're going to have have to reel it back in um, when you when you are under time constraints so it's just this interesting dance that mediation is and that's why I hear uh, a lot of mediators say that mediation is much more of it's not so much a science it's much more of an art because it's uh, based on experience, your, your life experience, the training you've had, uh, your co-mediator, working with a co-mediator, all of these things will um, contribute to the case that's in front of you. And you do the best you can, and um, what's going to happen is going to happen. And uh, we know that you, you tried your best, so you know, get that self-care that you need to you know, be able to take, take the next one and the one after that. Preparation, adaptability, persistence. I think, uh, the, uh, yeah, it's an art, it's a dance. Um, and thankfully, we have uh, cohorts of um, uh, high schoolers and younger who are learning how to and implementing peer mediation, implementing mediation um, at their schools. Uh, I would like to say if there's anybody who is watching this, um, uh, and they are interested in having peer mediation, whether you're a student who thinks this would be a great thing at your school or your club, um, or if you are an administrator or a family a member, like a, a, just a member of the community whose kids are in a school or whose niece and nephew are in a school, um, and you really feel like this is something that you want um, to learn or you want your kids to learn, um, we do have a resource page. And so I'm going to put that into the chat. Um, and this resource page, also going to share my screen here so you can see it. Um, this is a website that we've created. It is what is peer mediation. So it talks about um, some of our previous peer mediation conferen uh, conferences. Uh, what is peer mediation? How can you launch a, a program in your school or in your organization, uh, in your community, uh, and some other resources that are there and available um, to you? Uh, so we have a bunch of um, different uh, pieces there that you can use uh, as well as a way to stay up to date. So we've got some previous uh, conferences up on there. Um, and so with those resources, you can also reach out um, to Jose at the Matsunaga Institute. He's a great hub for it. So if you have any questions, um, he can connect you to the appropriate resources um, at, and get something started at your school, uh, at your club, at your um, organization. Uh, we don't have too many people online, but if somebody has a question for the panelists, um, we have a little bit of time uh, for, for any questions. I don't have any questions, um, but I just wanted to thank you guys so much for just being here and sharing all of your knowledge and experience. It truly has been very validating. You know, on my end, <laughs> parent in high school and just, you know, hearing people from different walks of life and whatnot and knowing that they're like, both, you know, and we see you guys said that there are people out there who have the same interests, who believe in the same things and that, you know, creates just a more hopeful Hopefully, you know, experience with just life in general. So just thank you guys. Like everything you guys said, like I said, was truly, truly validating. And I feel good about it. But okay, I feel good. I'm on the right track. We're doing good something. I'm doing what's happening, you know, because I've been in this position for a couple of years now. 
and you know, it's definitely different being like a student and a mediator to not I'm a you know employee and I'm a colleague. And it's just so different seeing the different you know perspective. You know, being back here on campus. So, and like I said, just hearing the things you guys are doing on the week, great. That sounds like what we're doing here and whatnot. So yeah, just thank you guys so much. This is really, really very helpful. And just, yeah, just good to just be here. And thank you guys for being here today and sharing. Thank you for what you're doing too. You've got the hard, heavy lifting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. With that, um, I am going to close with a small plug for an upcoming event that is also connected with the Peer Mediation um, Conference. Um, there, uh, a, a student through the Matsunaga Institute is a part of her culminating project for her undergraduate practicum, uh, is doing a presentation, and it is a presentation on Indigenous conflict resolution practices. It will be presented by Naomi Schubert. Um, it's going to be held, let me check the date, on April 27th, 1 o'clock. Uh, it will be another Zoom, uh, uh, Zoom presentation um, like this. I put into the chat there, it's pono.eventbrite.com. So that's P-O-N-O dot eventbrite.com. If you'd like to register for a ticket for it, totally free. It's going to be very interesting. She's a very interesting woman and, and has done a lot of research and um, is very knowledgeable about this. So that will be interesting um, to do as well. Thank you for your time here. Thank you to my panelists. Uh, really appreciate it. A wonderful, fascinating, um, um, just, you know, inundation of, of great knowledge um, uh, and things that, you uh, some of it I might have heard before, but definitely need a reminder um, <laughs> to be able to integrate into my life. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, will be helpful to the current peer mediators as they see this and, and can learn from you as well in this next stage. Uh, Jose, if you have anything else that you'd like to close out for, I just really do want to give a round of applause to my panelists. Thank you, thank you. And <laughs> applause to the counselors and teachers who are um, doing peer mediation programs in schools right now and the peer mediators who are doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie and uh, everybody, Anne, Robert, Lisa, Tino for, you know, sharing uh, and letting us delve further into this field. Uh, it's been quite a treat, you know, normally you used to, you know, peer mediation conference used to just be a one time thing. So now we've stretched it to two. And actually, uh, we might have three months this year because uh, both Tino and Shelly Andrews, who happens to be the peer mediation coordinator over at Kailua High, uh, have agreed to do one of our Matsunaga skills building sessions, which is basically free professional development. Uh, and we're tentatively planning that for Tuesday and Thursday, uh, May 23rd and 25th. Uh, and so that'll be, uh, if anyone happens to watch this and see this recording or, or sees it now and would love to learn further about it, um, just contact me. Uh, you can contact the main office email at uhip at hawaii.edu. Uh, and I'm happy to send you more information. Um, it's one of those things that we've done in the past. It's skills building. It'll be via Zoom. So we can definitely uh, bring folks in from different uh, areas who want to learn. So it doesn't just even have to be just Hawaii. Um, I believe it'll be 3 p.m. to 4.30 or uh, was it what do we agree 2 to 4 30 p.m uh hawaii time on that tuesday and thursday so i'm hoping that'll be a great opportunity for folks who are watching or want to learn further um i don't know if we shared about this vocan uh community that uh did we no we didn't uh <laughs> so one of the wonderful things that kind of came about this uh, year was uh one of our alum from our grad certificate and conflict resolution uh that is can knee tribal network uh over in uh washington state uh dealing with some issues of bullying and conflict uh we're really interested in learning further about uh, or getting her the students uh, educated in peer mediation and so um they were able to come over and tino and shelly uh you know shared their, their two days to be able to basically create a training for them. So about 16 students um, in high school level, I believe all of them, uh, th these are their student leaders uh, were able to go through this training. Katie was there as well, sharing about careers in 
mediation. So uh, kind of providing that extra link. So it is quite a treat. And I remember at the very end of it, they're like, well, I, you know, hopefully next year we can be part of the peer mediation conference. So it doesn't necessarily mean we have to stay in Hawaii. It's great to see how the community is just building beyond. And uh, I, like I say, I don't know where the journey is going, but it's been a good one so far. And it's been truly a treat to come along with it with you all. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for doing Thank this, you. Jose. Good job. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right.